please welcome Adam. Well, thank you so much, Ted, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be out here in the heartland. I'm a Midwestern boy myself, uh, born in Illinois, raised Indiana, and moved all around when I was an Air Force brat as a youngster. Um, it's good to be out of the uh, reality-free zone of Washington, D.C. for a while. First time in a year, in fact, and you, you spend that long there and you start to get a little bit too much time around the, the swamp creatures that uh, inhabit the D.C. area. It's really nice to be here and to talk to you about my favorite topic, one that's occupied my life. For 30 years now, I've been covering the uh, intersection of public policy and various types of emerging technologies. And what uh, my work focuses on is, is the question of what sort of policy vision should govern the future of various types of emerging technologies. Now, which technologies am I talking about uh, and that I'm going to uh, discuss here today? Well, there's quite a, a few different emerging technologies. The very nature of this sector, or this area, is that merging means there's something new almost every year to, to deal with. But the ones that I focus on most regularly in my work that I'm going to mention here today are things like uh, uh, autonomous systems and artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, advanced medical devices and systems, the so-called Internet of Things, uh, advanced transportation systems, virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing and additive manufacturing, and even cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. This is sort of the exciting frontier of uh, emerging tech today, and it's the things that are dominating public policy discussions in Washington, state capitals, and even international capitals. My work on uh, these issues has spanned 10 books over the last 30 years, but most recently my uh, 2016 publication, Permissionless Innovation, and my new publication from last year, Evasive Entrepreneurs and the Future of Governance, focus on these themes. And in my books, I have two primary objectives uh, that really come down to this. I first try to identify, well, what are the threats to technological freedom and the freedom to innovate? Um, and what drives what I call the sort of newfound techno-pessimism um, that's out there about emerging technology? The second objective of my work is to try to frame a positive response to techno-pessimism, to try to frame, uh, to borrow a phrase from someone else uh, named Matt Ridley, who's a great British science writer, a sort of form of rational optimism, not irrational exuberance about new technology, because all technology has challenges and problems, as I'll point out in a few moments, but rather to have a rational, respectful approach to appreciating and defending the freedom to innovate and technological change. So in my first uh, of these two books, I asked a question, you know, after 30 years of covering all these issues, I noticed every single debate about technology policy, media policy, innovation, it always comes down to a question of regulatory defaults and where we set them. And there are really two broad-based defaults we can think about when we talk about regulation of technology. Uh, one is the precautionary principle, and the other is permissionless innovation. So what do we mean by permissionless innovation? This is really an engineering concept that, that uh, became hot with the rise of the computing revolution. Um, it basically refers to the sort of general freedom to tinker, experiment with new ideas, engage in trial and error uh, freely. And it reflects sort of an openness to change and risk taking and even a fair amount of technological disruption. In terms of a public policy default, permissionless innovation stands for the idea of avoiding prior restraints on innovative activities, giving entrepreneurs and innovators more green lights rather than red ones. And to the extent there are problems that develop, trying to find flexible, bottom-up approaches as opposed to, to top-down command and control. <coughs> now, what's the precautionary principle? Well, the precautionary principle is the antithesis of permissionless innovation. It basically is the idea of crafting public policy in such a way that innovators and entrepreneurs aren't allowed to release their new technologies or services into the wild until they get somebody's blessing to do so. It's sort of a mother may I approach to uh, regulation. You know, you have to find some permission slip from some bureaucrat somewhere. And the burden of proof is on innovators to prove that their technologies are safe and won't cause any theoretical harms. Once you start thinking about the world in these terms, you realize this is a real conflict of visions, to borrow a phrase from one of my favorite uh, professors, Thomas Sowell, uh, who's written a book, great book, one of my favorite of all time, called The Conflict of Visions. And I've applied that, that mindset or mentality to the world of technology policy and said this is the way you can start thinking about how people of a precautionary mindset think about things like risk and innovation versus those of us in the permissionless innovation camp. And the, the heart and soul of the debate and the distinction between these camps come down to the, comes down to the fact that those with a precautionary mindset 
look at risk and try to figure out every possible way of anticipating it and avoiding it. Whereas those in the permissionless innovation camp tend to realize risk is an inherent part of life and business and that we have to roll with the punches and adapt to it and learn from it. But of course, that's a little too binary. There are actually many different points along a spectrum when you think about permissionless innovations versus the precautionary principle. And of course, the, the precautionary principle is a very bright red line saying, stop, don't go any further, ban this or restrict it. But you can have less restrictive forms of precaution. And likewise, permissionless innovation, sort of a green light on all activities, pretty rare to find. You usually have some sort of permits or some sort of restrictions that you have to deal with. But the bottom line is what I try to get across in my work is that it's better to start with the green light of permissionless innovation and work our way up with bottom-up solutions than it is to start with the red light of precautionary principle and say stop, don't go there, don't innovate until you get someone's blessing. Okay, does permissionless innovation work? Is this a good idea? Well, I think the, the proof's in the pudding. I think there's a lot of good examples in America of how permissionless innovation has played out positively over time, certainly more so in our country than most other countries. You look most, most notably and recently at just the computing revolution and the digital revolution, and despite the fact I know we're, we're all kind of worried about what large tech companies are doing today, the reality is, is that in the United States, we have some of the biggest and most envied technology companies in the world. Everybody else in the world wants to create a technology base like America's. And, and that was because of the fact that our technology companies, our digital companies, when they wanted to make new PCs or servers or email solutions, storage solutions, smartphones, websites, social networking, they did not need to go and get anybody's permission slip to do it. They just went out, blazed a trail, and did something different. They built that proverbial better, better mousetrap, and the world beat a path to their door. More importantly, money followed. Venture capital money flowed into America rapidly and dried up overseas because of our policy environment, because we got our innovation culture right. And talented immigrants flowed here too to take jobs in, in various tech companies to help out or invest in a lot of these same companies. This became the secret sauce that powered the digital revolution. We got our policy vision right. Thanks, by the way, into a bipartisan approach from both the Clinton administration and the Republican Congress working together in the 90s to get this right. By contrast, Europe adopted the exact opposite approach and really floundered. One of the things I always do when I visit law schools and business schools and other programs, I ask students, I'm like, can any of you name a leading digital technology innovator based in Europe today? And there's dead silence. And that's because Europe drove them out and they drove out the money and they drove out the talent. So this is a powerful, what economists and political scientists like to call, this is a powerful natural real world experiment in what sorts of policies work and which don't. Now here's a question. Can and should we extend this model, this vision of permissionless innovation, to other sectors? And I argue in my work, yes, we should. That if it would work for cyberspace, it should work for meat space. Uh, meat space is just the idea of like the physical economy and other traditional sectors. And uh, I think our general default towards entrepreneurialism and innovation in this country should be, and has been in many cases, innovation allowed. And there's a problem with that because we have so many sectors that are encumbered by so much precautionary constraints. In my work, I like to refer to technologies that are born free of regulation versus born in captivity. Uh, and so you think about born free, like what's interesting about things like internet services and social media and even other newer technology like 3D printing, virtual reality, AR, uh, general robotics, artificial intelligence, they don't have a preemptive regulatory regime yet, right? We don't have a federal robotics commission yet. We don't have an algorithmic act. We don't have a social media, you know, uh, 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 compact or regulation. By contrast, if you want to do something like driverless cars or commercial drones or new types of food entrepreneurialism or advanced medical devices or innovations in, in transportation and uh, financial services, well, you're confronted with multiple layers of overlapping rules, regulations, and red tape that encumber your ability to get off the ground. And this is why we have a very serious problem with new technologies trying to break into old fields or old fields try to reinvent themselves. Now, let's ask a bigger question. Why is it that precaution tends to be the default in so many technology sectors? Why do so many people fear the new and the different, new technology? In my work, I, I highlight five buckets of concern that people raise that often lead to calls for regulation or formal constraints. They tend to be based on things like privacy or psychic concerns, like uh, cognitive issues, 
How can technology affect my brain or my privacy? Secondly, there's broad-based safety concerns. That could be both physical safety of a traditional safety concern, but it could also be like a mental safety, like child safety. Third, security. That's both like things like cybersecurity and uh, hacking concerns, but also things like law enforcement, national security issues. The fourth bucket of concern that drives regulation is the traditional, the oldest one. It's the one that goes back to the time of the so-called Luddites, the people who were breaking machines because they were cons concerned about how new technology was, might disrupt their professions or jobs. So that economic bucket is still with us today. People are worried about, well, will automation undermine employment and uh, professions, so on and so forth. And then the fifth catch-all bucket is what's called existential risk, sort of end of days scenarios, like, oh my gosh, the robots are gonna rise up and take us over and slave us and kill us and eat us, you know, that uh, Terminator-esque kind of scenarios. Um, but it can also include like uh, runaway genetic testing and editing uh, capabilities, nanotechnology uh, eating us or something. So these are the th sort of things that you see again and again in the work of uh, uh, pundits and in the proposals of policymakers. In fact, here is a snapshot of some of the leading texts that are assigned in classrooms across America that cover science and technology policy. I've surveyed uh, the syllabi for various programs and uh, these are just some of the, the, the books that are being written and you can tell there's a sort of techno panicky mentality that drives what's being assigned to students. Books that say, you know, future crimes are out there, techno creep, voluntary enslavement by technology, re-engineering our humanity, click here to kill everybody. Well, it all sounds pretty ominous, doesn't it? I mean, this can make you think, if you're a student, like the world is full of awful things if we allow innovation to go forward. But it's not just academics, it's the media. I mean, every single media headline that leads in a newspaper, a magazine, or in television tends to be about panic, tends to be about downsides of technologies. Talking about how technology might be killing us or uh, advanced robots might rise up against us. And, uh, you know, so on and so forth. This collection of Time magazine covers, which probably pretty hard to see there, but I, my wall in my office have a 30-year collection of techno panicky Time magazine covers over time about all the things that that magazine has said we should be living in fear of. Good news, by contrast, is buried, right? Uh, good news is a sort of longer, slower process, but bad news sells and makes headlines. And that conditions us to be negative about technological innovation and entrepreneurialism. But that's not the worst problem. The thing that really leads people to be skeptical about technology is pop culture. Everywhere you look in television and movies and books and everything else in fiction, technology is a nefarious villain to be feared, right? Every single page of every book about technology is just dripping with dystopian dread about a future in which technology is going to be, well, like a Terminator or a 1984 scenario or one of the other many scenarios you see in these uh, movies or books or uh, shows in front of you. Um, good news just doesn't play well as a plot line in Hollywood. What do these techno-pessimists say in their writings and in their papers and in their movies and everything else? Well, the oldest critique of innovation and change is that it goes back to Karl Marx, who basically uh, he basically complained about sort of like capitalism being a cult of convenience and selling us things we don't need and giving us an illusion of choice. You know, we've all been puppeteered by uh, our, our corporate uh, nefarious overloads. Um, and so we don't need all that innovation. That's the oldest argument. And you still see this again and again and again in books and, and papers today. But then there's newer critiques. There's critiques like information overload, too much information, too much technology. Um, and we have information anxiety or data smog. Um, uh, for those of us who were, uh, you know, uh, around when humans first set uh, foot on the moon, we remember days where we were living in a world of information poverty, right? You only had a couple of local television stations and radio stations. You're lucky to have a local library. I didn't in my little small town in Illinois. Um, uh, and now we're complaining that you know, too much choice, too much information. Well, that's a pretty good problem to have by, a, by one person's standard, at least mine. Uh, there's other arguments, uh, technology undermining our humanism, leading to mindlessness, or things like AI and robots becoming a quote unquote dangerous master to be feared. And this leads a lot of these folks to say, believe it or not, that quote unquote, it's okay to be a Luddite. Basically saying yeah, it's okay to just start smashing the machines. Maybe we do it with law or regulation, but in some cases they want to go further. There's an entire movement afoot, basically mostly in Europe, but starting to spread here, called the degrowth movement that actually advocates reversing economic growth, pulling back on technology, moving backwards in time and slowing everything down and saying that's the key to human happiness. 
Believe it or not, they're actually doing this. What's most interesting is that the degrowth movement sells its books on Amazon for something like 120 bucks a piece. So funny how that works. Okay, so let me go step back and say something more about the precautionary principle because I, I don't take I don't take lightly, you know, I, I understand there's risks associated with technology. I don't want to be one of those people who says, ah, just get over it, you know, there's no problem here. No, there, there are some serious problems associated with technology and disruptive change. But what is really wrong with the precautionary principle as a regulatory constraint? Well, after 30 years of working on this issue, I finally found a way to bring it down to one line. The problem with excessive permissioning of innovation and the idea of precautionary principle is that if we spend all of our time obsessing about hypothetical worst case scenarios and then basing public policy upon hypothetical worst case scenarios, it means many best case scenarios can never come about. That it's only through ongoing trial and error experimentation and ongoing risk taking and even some failure that we learn, that we gain wisdom and that we therefore prosper and move on. When I was in Catholic school as a youth, uh, one of my Jesuit priests uh, made me aware of the works of St. Thomas Aquinas. It changed my life. I became a philosopher because of it. St. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas once famously said that, uh, to paraphrase him, if the sole goal of a captain was to make sure that his ship never sank, he'd never leave port. But of course, every captain braves the high seas and leaves port because he understands, he or she understands that there's a benefit to risk taking. You brave the high seas to gain rewards. There can be no reward without risk. That's never been more poignantly pointed out than in this cartoon, which is hard to see, so I'll read it for you, but it's a group of bureaucrats sitting around, and one of them says, we've considered every potential risk except the risk of avoiding all risks. That's perfectly stated, because if, the, if you try to avoid all risks, you put us in a far riskier situation. If you do not allow risk-taking and entrepreneurialism, you will ultimately lead to a stagnated world. As I point out here, the specific problems with the precautionary principle is you get less innovation, less opportunities, less entrepreneurialism, diminished entry and competitiveness, stagnant markets, cronyism tend to set in, an overall decline in the standard of living and economic growth. Oh, by the way, when this happens in some countries, other countries jump in because we live in a world of what I call global innovation arbitrage. People move around to wherever innovation and entrepreneurialism is treated most hospitably. And so you will lose competitive advantage if you become too precautionary. And for consumers, of course, this means fewer goods, less quality, higher prices. So overall, that's why I oppose the precautionary principle as the default in most policy debates. However, there are certain instances where risks are significant enough where we do need to have some precaution. There's a chart that appears in my books of where we have certain harms that might necessitate more regulation. When a harm is highly probable, tangible, immediate, irreversible, and catastrophic, we probably do need to take some steps to deal with it. There's a reason we don't allow people to roll tanks down Main Street or carry surface air missiles on their shoulders. You cannot possess uranium or certain dangerous chemicals. These are all probably pretty good preemptive precautionary constraints that we need to have. However, most things aren't like that, right? Most things fall into this other side of the chart. They are theoretical risks that sometimes are improbable, intangible, distant, or more importantly, addressable in other ways. They're reversible or addressed through more technological change. And so we need to understand that the left side of the most dangerous types of risk is extraordinarily rare. We do need to address it, but it cannot be the basis of all innovation policy. Okay, now let me shift gears and move on to what's the topic of my new book, because this is fun stuff. What happens when people actually sort of kind of take matters into their own hands and say, you know, I'm sick and tired of what's going on in this country and all of this cumbersome red tape I'm faced with, or the crazy outmoded archaic rules. I want to do something about it. And increasingly they are. And so after my last book on permissionless innovation was released, a whole bunch of people would come up to me and start giving me examples of how average people were being innovative in their own lives and communities to overcome crazy rules. I call these folks evasive entrepreneurs. Evasive entrepreneurs, broadly considered, are basically just any sort of innovators, or average citizens for that matter, who don't always conform with social or legal norms, and who set out to sometimes change public policy through innovative activities, utilizing what I call technologies of freedom. 
which is basically just sort of any sort of t technological device or platform that helps citizens work together to try to find a way to challenge public policy that might limit their liberty or their, their freedom to innovate or earn a living. Sometimes it goes further. Sometimes some people in groups utilize technology to openly and intentionally defy law, and I call this technological civil disobedience. People who basically set out to try to change laws through technological activities. And of course, this is facilitated by what I mentioned a moment ago, innovation arbitrage. The fact is, just like capital moves more easily now across jurisdictions and across the globe to wherever capital is treated most friendly, the same is increasingly true of innovative activity and innovators themselves. It's getting easier for a lot of folks to move around to find more hospitable places. So let me go through some case studies that I have in my book. These are in chapter two of my new book. I think we have some copies of the book here somewhere today. Yeah, they're over there if anybody's interested. Um, and so basically I go through these in chapter two and these are examples that are brought to my attention by average folks who came to my earlier book talks. So what should we do about these lawbreakers? First, here's a case study of pothole vigilantes. What's a pothole vigilante? A student told me about this at Maine University Law School one day. He said, have you heard about these people who are going out at night quietly working together using walkie-talkies and taking cement and stuff and they're filling potholes when cities fail to do so. And not only are they filling potholes, but they're making artwork on top of the potholes when they're done. Now, I love the one in the middle there that says, this is not a pothole. Uh, what should we do about those folks? This is, you, you know, you call public works and they're supposed to take care of it, but in some areas, especially in certain big cities, this picture is from New York actually on the left, um, it's just not getting done. And people are sick and tired of losing tires and having rims cracked because the city won't take a call or come to do the work. What should we do about those evasive entrepreneurs? What about people who use drones at weddings to take photographs of the wedding party? This is a hot thing these days. I don't know how many of you have seen this done, but you go to a wedding these days and increasingly the photographer will throw a drone in the air and take a big panoramic picture of the wedding party. It's really cool. Um, the interesting thing is, is that if that photographer is a professional photographer, he's supposed to be regulated one way by the Federal Aviation Administration and probably can't do it without a permit. Whereas if your drunk uncle says, I got a drone in the back of my car and I'll do that right now, <laughs> and he flies it, he's covered by a different set of rules. So it's interesting, if you charge one penny for flying a drone at a wedding and taking a photo, the law hits you hard, but if you charge nothing, you're not. That doesn't really mean, seem to make a lot of sense to me because the photographer probably has a reputational effect issue with the community, he's probably insured and he wants to get more business, right? The drunk uncle's like, eh, I'm sorry, I hit the bride in the head with the blade, you know? But that's the way the law works for these evasive entrepreneurs. How about this interesting case study of a 23-year-old man named Amos Dudley who, when he was in college, was very angry and upset because his mother couldn't afford Invisalign brace work to help him straighten his teeth. $8,000 or so at the time, and he was really mad in an effort to sort of stick it to the man and say, screw you big, uh, big companies, I'm going to create my own brace work. He actually used a 3D printer at his campus to create his own Invisalign brace work and then continue to refine it until he had aligned his teeth. Now, let's be clear, this is a bad idea. Kids aligning their own dental, you know, doing their own dental work, horrible idea, very risky. Amos did it. He was a smart kid. I think he went to Brown University, had a scholarship, so a uh, smart kid. But his friends started asking him, can you help me in line my teeth really cheap? And he says, hell no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not stupid. I don't want to get in trouble. But Amos did something different and interesting. He put all of his 3D printed blueprints and designs and pictures for how he did it online for the world to see. Should 23-year-old Am Amos Dudley be in trouble with the law for sharing risky information with the world about how to use technology. Here's another example just like that, 3D printed prosthetics. I've become involved with a group known, known as Enable and I've gone to their conferences where volunteers come and they bring their, their 3D printers and they share open source blueprints for how to create hands and arms for children with limb deficiencies. And at a conference at John Hopkins University Hospital several years ago, I attended one of these events and I saw kids, parents bringing their kids in who could not afford a professional prosthetic, thousands upon thousands of dollars, they couldn't afford it. They came to this conference and they were given free prosthetics by these volunteers. The kids would walk up and say, I want a, a hand to be printed that looked like Iron Man's hand or Wolverine's hand. And instantly it was fabricated on the spot. Again, free of charge for voluntary donations. You should have seen the smiles on these kids' faces. It was an amazing uh, experience for me. 
I was lucky enough that day to be de debating an FBA, FDA doctor from the Food and Drug Administration. And I said, doctor, correct me if I'm wrong, there's some really amazing things happening in this auditorium here today, but isn't this all illegal? These are regulated medical devices. These things, when they're professional, are supposed to go through a process of review, takes years, costs big money. These people are doing it for zero dollars and zero cents, and people are walking out of here with new hands and arms today. I says, are these people in trouble? Are they all going to jail? And it's like, well, not yet they're not. And everybody's like, wait, wait, what? what? When are we going to jail for offering kids free hands? You know, and isn't that crazy? And to the FDA's credit, they later came out with soft guidance, guidelines for saying how to do this and do this right. And I have no problem with that, sort of best practices for prosthetic made hands uh, with 3D printers. But it's a really interesting question, right? How should we handle voluntary groups utilizing technology to help these kids? How about parents trying to help their own children with diabetes? A group of dads came together who had uh, really great coding skills and took off-the-shelf insulin pump hardware and then put their own software in it to create something they called Night Scout, which was a superior way to monitor and deal with diabetes for their children. And these devices were found to be superior, in some cases, to professional uh, stuff that was sold and regulated by the FDA. These dads did this all just coming together voluntarily on a website. They put together a hashtag there that says, we are not waiting. What are they not waiting for? They're not waiting for FDA approval. And the FDA caught wind of this and they brought in a couple of these dads and said, take us to your leader. Who's in charge of this show? You know, we want to know what's going on. And they said, we're just some dads who are trying to help our kids because we're tired of waiting for the FDA to approve new, better insulin monitoring and delivery pumps. What should we do about those dads and moms that are doing this? Should they be in jail? How about everything that happened following COVID? In the wake of the COVID lockdowns, all sorts of people started doing things to help out with the response that were technically illegal. People started making their own face masks and hand sanitizers like breweries and distilleries and hospitals put out calls for people to bring in their 3D printers or at home help them make pieces or parts for ventilators when there were ventilator shortages in some hospitals. At one point, a 17-year-old boy used his coding skills to create what, what became the most popular coronavirus tracking site in the United States was getting more traffic than the CDC at one point. <laughs> Basically, people were, as this Wall Street Journal headline says in this picture here, they were innovating from their couch. They were doing interesting things in defiance of traditional laws and regulations because they thought, well, look, I'm just trying to help myself, my family, my community, hospitals, others out. Should that be illegal? A couple more examples cottage food industry. Food entrepreneurialism is really, really hot right now. There's really amazing things happening in what is obviously the, the oldest of all types of innovations, which is how do we create food for ourselves to feed our families and ourselves. And a lot of people are starting to engage in food entrepreneurialism out of their own homes. In some cities, including my own, you can, on an app, go and contact somebody and say, I'd like you to make me a home cooked meal and go pick it up at their house and bring it home. In some uh, certain cases, in DC uh, and San Francisco, you can actually go to people's homes, they'll prepare a meal at their dinner table for you. And you like order it up on your app and you sit there with them and their dog and their family. Um, this stuff is, uh, this is technically illegal. And a lot of it's been shut down. Uh, the Josephine Network out by San Francisco was told, the uh, county officials told the cooks that their meals that they were preparing to go were misdemeanors punishable by jail time. How dare you cook somebody a meal to go? Um, it's even gotten so bad that when people just voluntarily give it away at like church raffles and other things, there's been people who've cracked down on this. So food entrepreneurialism is another form of evasive entrepreneurialism. And a lot of it's just uh, moms who are cooking in their spare time because they're great cooks and they're doing something to make a little extra money on the side or give it away through apps, but the law is coming after them. How about Uber and the sharing economy? This is a popular example in many big cities. Uh, a lot of people uh, have heard of Uber and, and, and Lyft and they become quite popular. When Uber and Lyft first came to New York City, they were confronted with the fact that the mayor and a lot of the local unions did not want them there. And they started putting their cars in the streets and offering service. And the city says, no, we're gonna, help. We're gonna come down heavy and we're gonna regulate you. And they were about to. And then overnight, Uber recoded their app 
and I don't know how many of you have ever had a chance to use an Uber, but if you use it, there's a slider at the bottom that gives you options, like what kind of cars you can find, in this case, on Manhattan Island in New York. And so they recoded it so there was a new option at the bottom that said de Blasio mode for Mayor Bill de Blasio. And you swung over to that option and it said no cars available if the mayor gets his way. And it took you immediately to an email link where you could email and petition Mayor de Blasio to change his mind and not pass a law restricting these services. Overnight, the whole debate changed because Uber had enlisted their consumers as basically a group of sort of citizen lobbyists to go to bat against overzealous regulation of consumer choice in the market for ride sharing. Here's another example. Elon Musk, very famous innovator, does some interesting things with cars and rockets and more. Um, Elon Musk does something very interesting. I don't know how many of you have ever ridden in a Tesla or, or know how they work. Um, interesting, very high-tech car. And one of the things that happens in a Tesla is that literally overnight sitting in your garage, the Tesla is downloading code. It's like being refreshed and improved on the spot. And every night there's a nightly build where you can see what happens, how your Tesla has been tweaked or changed, like your computer gets tweaked and changed. A Tesla is basically a rolling computer on wheels. Well, one night, Elon Musk sends out a tweet and says, by the way, on your next improve uh, you know, uh, code for your car, I'm gonna offer you something called autopilot, where you'll be able to take your hands off the wheel for brief periods when you're driving down the highway. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Well, what's interesting about that is that Elon Musk didn't ask for permission from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration before doing this. And there wasn't even really a clear part of the NHTSA Motor Vehicle Safety Code that dealt with something like this. This was totally mind-bending new innovation that didn't even have a body of law for it. And so they were left confused, like, what do we do about this Elon Musk problem, right? And other people were doing the same thing. But the reality is, is that autonomous vehicles offer us the potential to save a lot of lives. Every single day in the United States, 100 people die, 6,500 people injured in automobile accidents. It's a public health disaster if you think about it. 94% of those accidents are attributable to human error. Why? Because humans get drunk, drowsy, and distracted, among other things. Robots and autonomous systems at least don't get drunk, drowsy, and distracted. And you have to believe we can bring down the death toll significantly with more autonomy and computerized assistance within a vehicle. So, should we restrict what Elon Musk doing? It, we haven't so far. He still doesn't have a formal blessing to do this. He just did it. Final area of uh, uh, case study, and I won't go into depth in this one, it's one that I'm least familiar with, but I've written a little on, which is the rise of cryptocurrencies, things like Bitcoin and blockchain technologies. Complicated area, but basically we're talking about highly decentralized forms of uh, monetary uh, systems and contracting systems. And it's really based on the radical idea that we can disintermediate what is one of the fundamental roles of the state, which is really basically controlling the entire financial system or at least money. I don't know yet how successful these cryptocurrencies and blockchain will be. Uh, a lot of my friends, a lot of my more libertarian friends are very gung-ho about it being highly disruptive. I'm a little bit more skeptical, uh, but it's a really important development and another example of evasiveness in action. So let's ask an ethical question now. I'm an, I'm an ethical philosopher. And, uh, is evasive entrepreneurialism defensible? Is it defensible when Americans take technologies of freedom and do interesting things, sometimes in defiance of law, either because they know it or sometimes because they actually don't? Yes, I think it is. I think we can defend evasiveness in the sense that we know that innovation expands the range of life enriching, life enriching goods and services at our disposal. That's the heart and soul of why we defend innovation writ large always and at all time. The more we can get, the better. But evasive entrepreneurialism also helps citizens pursue lives of their own choosing, to go out and try to find a way to earn an honest living and to offer benefits to themselves, their families, and their communities in the process. But third and most importantly, these sorts of evasive entrepreneurs and this Permissionless Innovation Act activity provides what may be the only meaningful check left on the growth of government and on outdated, outmoded government programs that have a life of their own and never seem to go away. And this is why I like to think about innovative acts as in the, almost as a sort of mini rebellions or revolts against a broken system. And that it can act as a sort of relief valve or sort of circuit breaker on, a, on the pressures that have built up in a, in, a, in, a, in a broken, archaic regulatory world. 
You know, uh, the folks at Deloitte, a consultancy, does a lot of con uh, interesting work. They came up with a survey of four or five years ago, I've got it in the book, and they surveyed the entire U.S. code, all the regulations in the U.S. federal code, all the rules and regulations. And they came up with the number that 85% of everything in the U.S. code had been changed once or never. It had been updated once or never. 65% of them updated never. The average business person is expected to change their business model every couple of years to keep up with the competition. And they're expected to be on their toes and be aware of new forms of disruption. Our government, by contrast, is in set it and forget it mode. It just puts rules in place, leaves them there, they gather dust, and then they just add more and more and more. And that regulatory accumulation really discourages entrepreneurialism and business formation and innovation. So that's how I defend evasive entrepreneurialism. So let me wrap up with just a few brief words about where we might be heading on the policy front. Uh, lots of interesting things happening in the world of technology policy these days. The one thing that, uh, to be obviously aware of, and uh, I think it's pretty clear, that we're in the midst of a major tech clash. There's a lot of opposition now to technological innovation, specifically to digital technology companies and social networks who uh, have angered people on both the left and the right for many reasons. But more, moreover, there's just broad-based interest now in really aggressive forms of antitrust regulation, maybe breaking up a lot of leading tech companies, not just in the digital space, but uh, others. There's lots of talks about changing liability standards to make uh, digital companies and others more liable for online activity. Um, there's more and more talk about the need for regulation, uh, aggressive preemptive regulation of things like robotics, automation, AI and a whole bunch of new industrial policy schemes floating around about subsidizing various things or even nationalizing some networks. During the Trump administration, there was talk of people saying, maybe we should nationalize 5G communications networks. So that's just Congress. At the state level, there's still more. There's a lot of talk at the state level about new types of privacy and security regulations, a big, big new push by some states to have new forms of digital taxation, not just sales taxes. We've already had that debate and kind of lost it. And there's now a new effort to expand that, but there's broad-based broadband taxes and other types of digital transactions that states are trying to tax. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there's all sorts of new narrowly targeted proposals at the state level for things like drones, driverless cars, the sharing economy, and more. Now, that's one side of the story, the policy story, what's happening. A lot of people want to regulate, but, but regulation is challenged by something called the pacing problem. The pacing problem refers to the fact that technological change tends to move very, very quickly, right? In some cases, technological change is almost exponential. Not always, but sometimes. But policy change is incremental at best. And so you have this tension now, as technology continues to accelerate, but policy continues to move quite slow, the gap between them becomes what's known as the pacing problem. Technology outpacing law's ability to keep up. Now one person's pacing problem is another person's pacing, pacing benefit, right? Because in some cases, this limits or puts a check on government's efforts to try to regulate everything. They're playing a game of regulatory whack-a-mole, like we got them, no, there's something new, but we got them uh, over here. And there's always something new popping up, right? So in my opinion, the pacing problem is kind of good news because I like the fact that technology continues to move at a healthy clip. But from regulators and lawmakers perspective, this is a chronic problem. But this is the tension between this and that, the tech lash and the pacing problem. We'll have to see how it plays out. In the meantime, those of us who defend entrepreneurialism and technological innovation, we need to get better about our messaging. We need to find a way to reframe the debate about the benefits of innovation in both intellectual circles and in policy circles. And I think the way we do that is to start talking about technological optimism or rational optimism over techno-pessimism. What do I mean by rational optimism or technological optimism? It's basically just the simple belief that we understand history shows us that the benefits of technological change greatly outweigh the costs and that there is great benefit in allowing ongoing trial and error experimentation in our society. More importantly, there's a link. There's a link between technological innovation and economic growth and pluralism and human betterment more broadly. And it's at a very individual level, our freedom to innovate is essential and it's part of our ability to try to find a way to earn a living and make our own lives for ourselves. And then finally, 
an important part of being a technological optimist or a rational optimist needs to be we avoid Pollyanna-ish kind of thinking or like irrational exuberance. We do need to admit technological change does have some costs. Technologies do have some risks. But we can come up with better constructive bottom-up solutions than the top-down precautionary types of proposals that are all too often the first order of business in Washington and state and international capitals. If you want to read more about the idea of sort of technological optimism, you can of course read my books. I'd be tickled if you did. But these are my heroes. Um, I'll just name two of the top there. Virginia Postrel's book, The Future and Its Enemies, and Calustus Jumo's book, Innovation and Its Enemies, Why People Resist New Technologies. Um, these are brilliant efforts to like dissect what it is that drives people to resist the new and the different and why we have to constantly sort of redouble our efforts to fight this fight. It seems to almost never go away as their case studies show. In the sense of what we can do about public policy, well, there's so much. I can't go through it all. I haven't even talked about things like tax policy today or all sorts of other things. But I have a couple of ideas. Um, I think. I like to talk about the need to reverse the burden of proof in our society with regards to innovation and entrepreneurs. And I do this for what I call the innovator's presumption. The law should not treat innovators and entrepreneurs as guilty until proven innocent. It should be innocent until proven guilty, right? It should be that we, sh we understand the benefits of change. And so we need to write into law whenever we can some sort of a clause that says any person or party, including the regulators, who oppose a new innovation, they bear the burden of proof of explaining why it's inconsistent with the public interest, why it is that innovation should be blocked. It's not the innovator that should have to make the case. It's the regulator. And this has been written in the law in some cases, but then unfortunately ignored. More importantly, we need sunsets. As I went through a moment ago all the data on like how backed up and clogged up our regulatory system is with regulatory accumulation, we need to find a way to hit the reset button once in a while. Our government never does a fresh house cleaning. We spring cleaning. We do them all the time ourselves, right? Our government never does. We don't sunset laws on a periodic timetable, and that's why that happens. At least we should be doing that with new technology enactments. If you put a new law in place governing a new technology, it ought to say that any existing or newly imposed regulation should include a provision sunsetting that same provision within two years. Because that's about the pace of change that people are expected to invent in, to reinvent themselves at in the business world these days. Why not government? They can always put the law back on. If it's a good idea, we can keep putting it back on the books. I have no problem with that. But you should prove it. It shouldn't just be set it and forget it. Third, this is a little more complicated, but in almost every single debate, about technological change and, and just competition policy more generally. You have a bunch of people who are already incumbents who don't like to see the new guy in town come along. They don't like new entrants. They don't like competition. And so they say, well, we can't allow the new people to come in because we've already got all of these rules that govern us, and they're going to be coming in on a different set of rules, and that's an unlevel playing field, the unlevel playing field problem. And I say, that's right. That's a fair point. We shouldn't have an unlevel playing field in law and regulation. But there's two ways to level the playing field. We can level it in the direction of more repression by imposing the old regulations on every new technology, or we can level it in the direction of more freedom. If Uber comes in town and disrupts the taxi cab industry, the answer is not to regulate everybody like taxis, it's to get rid of the misguided old taxi cab regulations. It's to give the taxi folks more freedom like Uber gets. And you can apply that across the board through something I call the parity provision, which is that basically, any operator offering a similar situated service should be regulated no more stringently than their least regulated competitor, right? Not the most regulated. And then finally, I'll just wrap up with this reform because this isn't mine, but this is one that has actually gaining some traction in some states. Arizona, uh, I think uh, Nebraska, a couple of others are passing so-called right to earn a living laws. This is an effort to really address what is the most chronic problem facing entrepreneurs today in terms of per uh, permissioning and precaution, which is occupational licensing regulations, which are really excessive and far too many occupations are over licensed or over permitted. We need to have occupational licensing reform and we need to tether it to a broad based sort of theme or vision that economic liberty and the right to earn a living is essentially a civil right. That we should treat that as a human right. You have a right to go out and earn a living for yourself and for your family to make the world better. That's what these laws do. They give us our economic liberties back and then tether it to positive reforms of the most onerous laws and regulations. So I'll just wrap up with a couple of my favorite cartoons because 
At this point in the talk, sometimes people are a little down, oh my gosh, what, what's gonna happen? They're a little concerned. But there are reasons for hope. We should remember that all throughout history, there's been opposition to technological progress. This cartoon on the left is one of my favorite. It a, shows a caveman rolling a wheel up to, to his friends and they say, no wheels here, no new, no new technology, no. You know, and there's always somebody who says, no, you just you gotta stop. And then the, the one on the right is a little bit harder to see. It's a, it's a bunch of candles standing around as a light bulb's being led to the gallows. And you better believe if the candles would have had a vote, they would have definitely set the light bulb to the hangman. And here's the good news, right? Despite all that opposition, we got the wheel and we got the light bulb. Technology has a bit of momentum of its own, and that's a good thing. It isn't an unstoppable momentum. Policy, regulation, government can stop technology and innovation and entrepreneurialism. But we should remember that people want choices. They want innovations. They want freedoms. They want these things in their lives because they better their lives. Try telling anybody like, you know what's a good idea? I think we should take away all your smartphones. And some people might say, yeah, oh, maybe. But most people would say, get your, help, get your hands off my smartphone. No way, <laughs> right? It's just something we're now wedded to, right? We enjoy these technologies. We bring them into our lives because we believe they better our lives. So that's my hope, is that I can continue to make the case, the positive case, for rational optimism. And I hope it's a case that you'll help me in making. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. We've got a few minutes, and uh, my understanding is you've got a few minutes that you'll sure. be able to take questions. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to go with the Packinger Club members first. I'm going to ask Joe if he'll handle the microphone. I'd like to comment about uh, some people that I've uh, met in the Air Force that uh, showed great innovation. <laughs> One of them is. Uh, Chuck Hayden, famous test pilot, investor, first person to invest with an investor with speed sound. Also, uh, uh, Paul Tibbetts during World War II. Uh, Paul Tibbetts, who. Uh, <laughs> yeah, damn technology. Paul Tibbetts, who uh, flew the Enola Gay. The B-29 at that time was unsafe to fly because of the engines. They were constantly catching on fire and they were fighting for a while. And he took two women that had been trained for pilots as pilots that buried their aircraft across the country, many types of aircraft. He took two of them and put them in a B-29 to demonstrate that they could fly and the guys that were supposed to be flying it were not, were going to see that if they could do it, we could do it because they were afraid to fly the B-29, and, and that's, that, that was innovation. Now the second thing that I'd like to speak about is prosthetics. Julie Dombo, who's from uh, Derby, lost both arms and both legs below the knee, both the arm below the elbow, and she has prosthetics now, but insurance did not cover them, but what? Well, how I see? <laughs> well, uh, let me finish on this. <laughs> The insurance companies would not cover that for her. And through donations, that's what paid for her arms and legs. Oh, wow. That's an amazing story. Uh, I mean, the, the Air Force pilots, great American heroes. My father was in the Air Force, passed away in the Air Force, and I, I mean, I honor those heroes. And the, the great thing about that story is the amazing technologies that those pilots were able to take advantage of and the American superiority in aviation and aeronautics is just a phenomenal, great American success story, right? Uh, on the prosthetic story, that's another amazing story. I'm glad you told it and thank you for that. Um, uh, it's sad that the insurance company wouldn't pay for it. Luckily, with new innovations, hopefully we can find ways to get more people, more things like that, not just prosthetics, but many other types of uh, medical innovations that, that, that they need. Okay, we've got a second question over here. I'm sorry because of time. I hate to interrupt. Sure, yeah. Let's take this one. Uh, two part question. One, we want innovation, but sometimes even innovative companies, they get big mm -hmm. and they're not as interested in innovation. They donate money to politicians in order to squelch innovation. Yep. So could you comment on that? And number yep. two, how do the unions play 
innovation? Yeah, a great, great question. Uh, the first question, you're absolutely correct. Couldn't say any better myself. This is a chronic problem. Milton Friedman diagnosed this problem many years ago. Um, and talking about how often it's the case that the small upstart gradually becomes the, you know, the status quo defender. And I see it every day myself. A lot of the biggest tech companies that started out as just literal like uh, experiments in a garage now are the biggest lobbying presence in Washington, D.C., Google, Facebook, Twitter, the biggest lobbying offices there are. Um, and what's so dangerous about that, as has just happened with Facebook most recently, is they did become defenders of regulation. And why do they become defenders of regulation? Because they can absorb compliance costs that their competitors cannot. <laughs> And this is a really troubling thing. And it just reminds us that, you know, unfortunately, sometimes capitalists are not the best defenders of capitalism. They need to be reminded how they got to where they were and the things they took advantage of to get there. Uh, I could tell you a story about the time I had lunch with Bill Gates and how he professed to be a great defender of capitalism when the government was after his butt in an antitrust case, only to have two years later hear another speech by him where saying, we need to regulate the living hell out of Apple, Google, and everybody else. And so, <laughs> Wait a minute, sir. And his exact lawyer that defended him in the antitrust case then went on the, on the, on the war path against all those companies, filed the exact same comments saying two different things. Ah, it drives me crazy. Unions, yeah, they stand in the way of a lot of progress, um, no doubt about it. They are specifically concerned about economic disruption. We often have to cut deals to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, in the railroad context, in the driverless truck uh, and car context, we're going to have to cut deals to basically say as automation happens within the cabin of these things, they're going to continue to have jobs. We're just going to have to buy off people so they're going to lose jobs and we need the innovations. That's the way it's going to have to work, unfortunately. One. Okay. Uh, does anyone mind if we go over five minutes? So if people need to leave, please go ahead and leave. But, but, uh, uh, Sorry, I went a little long. Uh, I wanted to thank, uh, publicly thank uh, Professor uh, Dr. Ted Malema at Wichita State University Institute for the study of economic growth for graciously sharing this wonderful presentation with us. Let's give them a nice hand. A quick question, uh, uh, Airbnb, which does, City of Wichita is in a conundrum right now because someone rented their house out and someone was murdered and, and they, they discovered that, that uh, the zoning for that single family house didn't allow for Airbnbs. What kind of solutions or what, how should we be dealing with those kind of problems? Yeah, it's a hard question. You know, uh, I'm a defender of, of the sharing economy and of, uh, of, you know, house sharing. It's been a wonderful sort of second stream of income for a lot of families, uh, a way to make a little extra money. Um, and to retire early, and so that's great. But on the other hand, we know that there are quality of life concerns and, and many, uh, many neighbors and others are worried about these things. Airbnb takes these issues pretty seriously and actually has a lot of different approaches to trying to deal with them. There are also certain local ordinances and rules that have new restrictive covenants on exactly what can be shared and how long and so on and so forth. Um, but, but yeah, this is an ongoing tension, I think. I, I, I don't think this goes away easily. There's an easy solution to it. But the question is, do we want to get rid of the sharing economy and home sharing and space sharing altogether? I don't think so, right? And so I think we're going to see a gradual refinement of best practices for space sharing. And not just in the home sharing, apartment sharing context, but even in office sharing. Office sharing is a huge issue now, especially in big cities where people can't afford offices anymore. So there's space sharing. And this is happening in real time with like people working three, three cubicles, three different organizations is a very common thing in Washington now. So I think it's a slow, gradual process of finding a new set of rules that will accommodate both innovation and uh, community safety. We'll take two more questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. As you know, uh, in the last presidential election, the tech companies barred any talk about Hunter Biden. I think that had an effect on the presidential election. Isn't it time to vote 230 and stop this, this process of preventing uh, talk that would influence the presidential election? So uh, there's a good chance that Section 230 will be repealed or modified. However, that would certainly open the floodgates to a lot of regulation, a lot of litigation, a lot of trial order activity that could discourage a lot of new emergent platforms, including conservative viewpoint platforms. Even something like Parler could be sued at some point. 
So the question is, is this really a 230 issue? A Section 230 is a complicated thing that is a, a law from 1996, liability exemptions for tech companies. But really, it's more of a First Amendment problem, which is the question of what are the First Amendment rights of private digital platforms to exclude certain people or organizations that they don't agree with? This is a problem that goes back to the broadcast and newspaper era. And there's a lot of actually cases and controversies and laws about do I have a right to have access to the biggest media platform in town? In 1992, a Supreme Court case, a case went all the way to the Supreme Court with the Miami Herald, was someone who was angry that said that they were slandered in the pages of the Miami Herald and demanded to have a response and an access. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court voted unanimously, no, you have no right to a response in the Miami Herald, even though it was clearly far and away the biggest media outlet in the southern part of Florida. So the question is, is who controls what is said on these platforms? And my argument would be, I understand the frustration with them and the overzealous activity towards conservatives, but our answer should be what it was when Ronald Reagan vetoed the Fairness Doctrine in the late 80s. We want more and better platforms, more competition, more choices, that the law ultimately probably will never serve us well to get more and better alternatives for conservative viewpoints out there. That would be my take on it. Last question. Yes. Thanks for being here today. My question has to do with privacy. I value con the convenience and all of the benefits of being able to have all of this technology. But what do you see as the trends in, in protecting consumer privacy? You know, I, I don't know whether you should be more concerned about government getting your information or big business getting your information or whoever getting your information. I don't care if they have it, I just want them to keep it to themselves and use it to serve me. Yeah. Yeah, no, great question. I get that question a lot. I've done a lot of work on it, and it's a tough, it's a tough issue. I mean, there's no doubt that the digital economy is built upon data flows. And the reason we get so many of the services we do today free of charge or very, very cheap is because we're cross-subsidizing it with our personal information. And that has trade-offs, and some of them are concerning because we don't always know where our data is going or how it's being used or, worse yet, shared or given away, right, especially if it's given away to the government. That concerns me, too. But I do know this, that if we actually try to take a step to say, well, you can't share that information or it's going to be greatly locked down, the first thing that's going to happen is prices are going to go up. And so there's a really legitimate question, like how much do you want to pay every month for something like Facebook? You know, you want to pay 29 you know, bucks a month for Facebook? 20? Nine bucks? Whenever I ask people that in a crowd, nobody wants to pay a dime for it because they're used to paying nothing. <laughs> you know, zero is a good price. And uh, it's the same for tweets and Google searches and everything else. So. This trade-off is a, is a tense one, and I, I totally appreciate the privacy concerns and often work with companies to try to say, can we come up with better best practices so that people have more power over these things? Believe it or not, if you take a look at your settings in something like Facebook, there are very robust privacy settings. You can really lock things down, only share with very specific people. The funny thing is, is that most people tend to just open it wide up and they treat their lives like an open diary, right? And they just blow it all out there. And same with my kids on Instagram and other things. I think part of this is just a human problem, which is that we just kind of had a tendency to overshare. And maybe it's sort of almost a, an etiquette or what's sometimes called a netiquette issue. We need to teach people like better internet manners and behaviors, including sensible controls over your own personal information. I'm, I just, I, I really, really lock down a lot of my stuff and, and don't overshare. Um, but then I look at a lot of my friends and family who are concerned about this and I say, wow, they're, you know, their life is all out there to see. <laughs> so it's, it's a tough call. And um, obviously the companies are going to share more and more because that's in their incentive to do so. We have to change our own behaviors and then expect them to change theirs too. Let's give Mr. Adam Thier a big round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all.